told her. I want you. Please say you'll be mine. And your beak looks like strawberry wine. Uh, my thesis is called A Studio of One's Own, rewriting the Western classical singer's undergraduate curriculum with an intersectional feminist lens. So, let's unpack that. <laughs> so, uh, my thesis was inspired by Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own. A uh, Room of One's Own explored Woolf's experiences as a woman writer at the turn of the century, and upon discovering that there were almost no women prior to Jane Austen in the library, Wolf asserted that women needed a room or a space of their own to write and create. So, I know there's a lot of big words. Let's tackle another one. What is intersectional feminism? While Wolf was certainly ahead of her time in many, many ways, Modern feminism seeks to address the intersection of identities to encapsulate the lives of women. Kimberly Crenshaw was the first to coin the term of intersectional feminist in her essay, Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity, Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. While Crenshaw looked at identity as it relates to violence against women, many of her ideas are relevant for all parts of feminist pedagogy. Because of their intersectional identity as both women and of color within discourses that are shaped to respond to one and or the other, women of color are marginalized within both. Intersectionality in feminism leads to a discussion of privilege. Privilege is the concept that some people's lives are easier based on given identities, such as being white or male. Feminist writers such as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie address this quite well. Here I have, some people will say, well, poor men also have a hard time, and they do. But that is not what this conversation is about. Gender and class are different. Poor men still have the privilege of being men, even if they do not have the privileges of being wealthy. As you can see from this political cartoon, often people think that by judging someone on the same terms, that is true fairness. However, without taking into account the benefits of privilege, we don't put people on level playing fields. The discussion of privilege can often be uncomfortable which is why I've included this meme. <laughs> Often pe times people feel attacked with the concept of privilege. People will say, not all men are responsible, or why should I be judged when my life has been hard as well? In the words of Batman, it's simply not about you. <laughs> or better yet, it's not about that. No one is contesting that your life has had hardships. What we disagree with is that there is this idea that there's a level playing field for everyone. So, previously in historical terms, women and composers of color have been left out of the standard teaching repertoire. I think it's time to change that. We need to use the idea of feminist pedagogy for all voices to speak and to be listened to, as Barbara Coyman says. It was not so long ago that most people thought there were no relevant composers to date. This brings me to this quote by Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland's most renowned teacher was French composer and composition teacher Nadia Boulanger. 
However, even he felt that it was possible that women's music would be forgotten in the canon. Is it possible that there is a mysterious element in the nature of musical creativity that runs counter to the nature of the feminine mind? And yet there are more women composers than ever writing today, writing moreover music worth playing. The future may very well have a different tale to tell. For the present, however, no woman's name will be found on the list of world-famous composers. Hmm? What? <laughs> I'll be honest, this quote left me with a lot of questions. If this was the mindset of Aaron Copeland, who actually acknowledged the worth of women's writings, then what hope do we have for bringing women into the undergraduate teaching canon? Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we have to talk about the measuring stick in music. People often ask, what is the significance of trying to go back and change what's been done? Marianne Keelan Bert Gilbert says it best. Why multiple feminisms, genders, sexes, sexualities? Because all of us need alternatives to describing experience from the or a man's perspective. Men are not the measuring stick for what is acceptable. To that end, I add, neither is white the measuring stick, neither is European, neither is wealthy. So what effect does this have on the teaching canon? Well, Marcia Citron ex emphasized the best reason for the teaching canon, and essentially it boils down to what we learn shapes our views of music both as a performer and an audience member. Either we only want to sing what we've learned because we think that is what's of value, or we only pay for music we know. It's a true disservice to students in undergraduate school for us to hold only one view of what classical music can be. So in order to truly prove the importance of this music, it becomes necessary to prove that even by current standards, this music holds up. Here's a general synopsis of audition requirements from top music schools, such as Juilliard, Curtis, and Indiana University. What I did, there we go, is a cross-reference. So you can see here that these three schools, highly ranked, have at least one song or aria from the Italian, German, French, English language, and sometimes ask for another language, another aria, et cetera, et cetera. Tonight, I will be presenting music that fulfills these categories. If you all turn to page one of your handouts, um, I then use Christopher Arneson's rubric four from his book, Literature for Teaching. You'll find full analysis uh, and evaluations of this, you, you can find the basic outline on page one. So basically what we're evaluating here is accompaniment, characterization and acting, diction, articulation, dynamics, melismatic phrasing, musical considerations, range, tessitura, registration, respiration, text setting, vowel and vowel sequences, words, poetry, lyrics, and libretto. 12 to 28 points is considered easy, 29 to 44 points, is moderate and 45 to 60 is difficult. So as we start going through the genres, we're starting with early music. Um, this features our aria requirement. In early music, only white women of means or women in religious orders have been recorded throughout history to the point that they are easily researchable. Elizabeth Jacques de la Guerre was a prolific composer who lived from 1665 to 1729. At some point, she was ranked even higher than many male composers, second only to Jean-Baptiste Lully. At this time, I invite Dr. Kim to come on stage. We're going to do some singing. Um, we study a piece from our operatic aria requirement 
This aria comes from Cephale et Procris. The story centers around these characters from Ovid's Metamorphosis. The libretto was written by a minor po poet, Francois Duchet de Valsy. Interestingly, the libretto would have been regarded as weak because of Duchet de Vancy being a minor poet. Coincidentally, there were only a few performances after the premiere in 1694. The Act Two, Scene One aria features Procri singing sadly at the foot of Mount Himet. She bemoans the fate of her and Cephale and hopes that the solitude of her environment will bring her peace. This rates as a 37, largely due to long phrases and some jumping of octaves, which is common stylistically. You can see this on page two. As we get into the classical era, privilege still played an integral part in composition. This brings us to Isabella Colbron. She lived from 1785 to 1845. She married Giacomo Rossini and largely contributed to her career by being a famous soprano and singing Rossini's operas. We turn to Colbron's music tonight to highlight the Italian art song requirement. La Speranza al Cor Mi Dice comes from her second collection, Giusieme Russell, that was published in 1808. Pietro Metastasio was the librettist for all four of her song collections. Colbron actually only wrote four collections in her life because of her demanding singing career. 
While it is true that her output was small, Colbrand's work demonstrates superior knowledge of the voice. The melody of this piece is enjoyable and many of the phrases move in stepwise melismas. The almost constant triplets in the accompaniment create a duple versus triple meter texture that will offer some challenges for the beginning student. The piece comes in as an easy overall at a 24 and you can find a full analysis on page three. to publish works. <laughs> it's important to note that while we have more records of these women, it is unfair to assume that more women were not writing music prior to the Romantic era. We start with Clara Schumann. Clara Schumann, born Clara Wieck, studied piano with her father and composition and theory with, her, with other great teachers in Leipzig. Her piano career was prolific. After Clara married Robert Schumann, she prioritized Robert's own work over her own. Clara played Robert's concerts and also often acted as a rehearsal pianist. She even arranged many of his instrumental works for piano. Carol Knowles Bates draws attention to the common patriarchal norm in Clara Schumann's time. There were these distinctions between feminine and masculine music. Feminine music was supposed to be, by definition, graceful and delicate, full of melody and restricted to the smaller forms of song and piano music. Masculine music, by contrast, was powerful in effect and intellectually rigorous in harmony, counterpoint, and other structural logic. Symphonies, operas, and similarly large-scaled works lay in the realm of masculine music. Clara Schumann fell into this herself and often internalized these sexist ideas. She wrote in her diary in September 1847 the following. I received printed copies of my trio today, but I did not care for it particularly. After Robert's D minor, it sounded effeminate and sentimental. Clara composed Walzer to Johann Peter Leiser's words. Leiser was a painter and writer in Leipzig. If you're looking for leader, look no further. The difficulties come from the fast-paced German consonant clusters 
and the setting of the text in the passaggio. For instance, measures 28 through measures 35, which I've highlighted here, the word leva is set on the break of the passaggio each time in two separate instances with at least one closed E on the highest part of the contour of the phrase. Because of these challenges, it is a moderately difficult piece and is a 35. A full analysis can be found on page four of your handout. On July 18th and 1821, Pauline Viardot was one of several musicians in her family, including her father, the famed Manuel Garcia. Upon his death, Viardot continued training and teaching the Garcia method. She was also an impressive singer with a three octave range. She met her husband, Luis Viardot, at the Teatro Italien, where he was director. Almost a completely reverse situation to Clara Schumann. Louise Viardot gave up his position and followed Viardot on her tours. In searching for French melody, this is the perfect choice. Viardot's song, Bonjour Mon Coeur, was originally published as a single song under VWV 1072 in 1895. The librettist was Pierre de Ronsard and was dedicated à Monsieur Félix Lévy. It's important to note that Viardot said only the first part of Pierre de Ronsard's poem. Instead of finishing the poem, Viardot set the piece to finish on the text, Bonjour, ma douce rebelle, or hello, my sweet rebel. Because of the allegretto tempo, the air is allowed to move more freely and quickly, which will be perfect for the developing classical singer. 
Since many undergraduate voice students struggle with the French language, the brevity of the piece allows for the French to be isolated for further study. The most difficult part of the song is the sparse accompaniment, which will, allow, which will require the singer to have vocal independence. Overall, this piece is ranked at a 25, easy, uh, and uh, a complete analysis can be found on page five of your handout. were changing for representation. Finally, <laughs> I felt it was a meme appropriate time. <laughs> First, we start with Dame Ethel Smith. She was born on April 22nd, 1858 in London. Perhaps one of her most famous pieces was the March of the Women, which she composed in 1911 for the English suffragette movement. Smith was actually so devoted to the suffragette movement that she was arrested for throwing a brick through the window of parliament. Ethel Smith, in addition to being a prolific composer, also wrote memoirs and essays at the end of her life. Her memoirs and biographies detailed her thoughts on music, activism, and her open lesbian relationships and feelings for prominent women, such as Lady Pauline Trevelyan, Lady Mary Ponsonby, and Edith Somerville, among others. Smith challenged the ideas of feminine music and wrote many large-scale works. She often felt that until we can take gender out of music, she would not be judged fairly for her work. Smith published this piece as a third in a collection of songs called Three Moods of the Sea in 1913 in Vienna. These pieces are all excellent English art song choices. Because the piece is written in a con consistent mezzo-soprano range, it would be excellent for an undergraduate soprano or mezzo-soprano looking to build their middle. The tonality shifts throughout the piece, so it is important that the student has a good understanding of harmony. The slow tempo creates long lines that can be challenging for beginning students. This piece comes in at a 29 or moderately difficult for these reasons. You can see this on page six. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we now move on to Florence Beatrice Price. Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1887. The Jim Crow laws drove her family to the north in 1927, and in Chicago, Price was able to make full use of our art opportunities. In the early 1930s, Price wrote over 300 pieces. At that time, African Americans, like women, were not expected to write large-scale works. Despite all racist expect expectations, in 1931, Florence Beatrice Price wrote Symphony in E Minor. In 1933, um, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra premiered that work. This premiere made history as the first performance of a major orchestra playing a large-scale orchestral work by an African-American composer. Florence Beatrice Price's compositional style often featured folk elements and did not shy away from her use, from use of her African-American identity in her music. In 1941, Florence Price set Langston Hughes' poem, Song to the Dark Virgin. The accompaniment is largely harmonically supportive, but does have some rhythmic counterpoint. She creates large sweeping lines and specific dynamics with these lines to draw on the emotion of the sensual text. This piece is especially suited to an undergraduate student and would be another excellent choice for an English art song. Postmodern era, it understandably lends itself best 
to representing all people and giving the opportunity for more voices to be heard in music because of the shifts in our own societal culture. So we start with Betty Jackson King. She was born in 1928 and is famously known as a Chicagoan. She studied piano and composition at Roosevelt University, Oakland University, Glassboro College, Peabody College, and Westminster Choir College. She also taught in Chicago Public Schools and the Laboratory School at University of Chicago. Among her works are operas, a ballet, spiritual arrangements, and art songs. Her pedagogical background is incredibly apparent in her piece in the springtime. The piece has open vowels on the notes in the higher range, as is seen here. The accompaniment is supportive harmonically and often rhythmically. Due to these determinants, it is a fairly easy piece, ranking as a 17, found on page 8. This piece would be suited for developing classical voices searching for English art songs. This piece could actually even be considered for a talented high school student. to Irma Urteaga, was born on, 9, on March 7, 1929 in San Nicolas, Argentina. She studied choral and orchestral conducting at the National Conservatory in Buenos Aires and at the Instituto del Teatro Colón. According to Patricio Caicedo, although her aesthetic is atonal, she uses tonality and modality when needed. This piece is from a song cycle called Cantos para Soñar. Irma Orteaga wrote in her book about this cycle. In the summer of 1993 in Buenos Aires, and due to the lack of technology, my phone was silenced for several days. I experienced the need of just singing with my voice, the instrument that I loved the most. Alongside the music of the piano, I conceived the cycle of four lullabies. Orteaga recognized the use of modality in this piece, which is part of what makes it challenging. The accompaniment proves, provides some musical support, but the voice is fairly independent. Another difficult point is that the vowels in the passaggio, again, are on the, often on the E vowel, the most closed. For a student with a solid sense of independent singing and understanding of modality, this would be a great piece. Overall, this piece rates as a 36 and is moderately difficult. Often, at grad schools, I don't know if you remember from earlier, um, ask for other languages beyond the standard four. This would be an impressive choice.
Our most current classical composer, Jennifer Higdon, was born in Brooklyn, New York, on December 31st, 1962. Higdon's first instrument was the flute at age 15, and she did not begin studying composition until age 21. Higdon has been commissioned by orchestras across the United States for her work. She actually won a Pulitzer Prize for her violin concerto and a 2010 Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Classical Competition for her percussion concerto. Many reviews of her works also quote her changing textures. This would be an ideal piece for an undergraduate learning more contemporary music. Higdon creates text painting in her accompaniment with rising motions like the sun stretching over the horizon. Because Higdon focused so much on the colors and textures of this piece, teachers should only give this to students capable of singing without harmonic or rhythmic support from the piano. Overall, this piece is rated at a 32 for some of these changes and presents another option for an English art song. Find this on page 10. <laughs> It's become increasingly more important to be able to teach musical theater, and thus there's even been more pedagogical text written about this subject. Zena Goldrich is a musical theater composer. She played keyboards in the orchestra of Avenue Q, Bombay Dreams, Oklahoma, and Titanic. She composed music for televisions, ABC, and PBS. Since 1993, um, she has written music with author and lyricist Marcy Heisler. They are known together as the duo Goldrick and Heisler. Excuse me. Famed composer Maury Yeston states, Zena Goldrich and Marcy Heisler are the most gifted new writing team of their musical theater generation. They create music and lyrics that are as fresh, bright, witty, and, and accessible as have ever been written. I was fortunate enough to reach out to Marcy Heisler via email and get a response. According to Marcy Heisler, the piece I'm singing, Los Pinguinos, was a specialty number from a musical called Allison Under the Stars that was workshopped at Second Stage in 2000. 
She said, there's not a lot of plot behind it. I have a close friend whose father is the head of geophysics at University of Michigan and gave cruises to Antarctica. I chose penguins as an homage to him. This piece makes use of unconventional vocal gestures to invite abrupt registration shifts and encourage strong character development. At measure 60, the singer employs a mixed chest register to sing an E flat, which can be seen in the image here. Due to its lightness, the piece was ranked as a 24 or easy. conclusion, it is important to remember a few things. There are not pedagogical reasons per for perpetuating white maleness in classical music. We must continue asking questions of how to move forward. People often ask, what if Mozart hadn't died so young? What if he had lived a long life and composed the whole time? I truly believe this is a good question to ask. But if we ask that question, I think we also need to ask the same questions about women composers. What if society had given them the same chances? What if they had the same opportunities? What benefits will our students have by giving these composers equal voice in the studio? In the words of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in her book, We Should All Be Feminists, culture does not make people. People make culture. If it is true that the full humanity of women is not our culture, then we can and must make it our culture. Thank you everyone so much for coming. <laughs> And, 
and a round of applause for Dr. Kim. <laughs>